please come to order. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mandy, could you please call the roll? Young. Yeah. Here. Vanderhorst? Here. Vanstra? Here. Four? Here. Hopkins is absent, and Carl Stone will be attending a little bit late. All right. Uh, I'll need a motion for approval of the tentative agenda. I want to make sure to note that the closed session agenda item J1 has been removed from the agenda, so a motion for approval of agenda as amended. So moved. Four. Four. Render horse four. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say yes. Opposed, no. Mandy, please call the roll. Render horse? Yes. Four? Yes. Young? Yes. Answer? Yes. Motion passed. <coughs> uh, we have time for a public forum. Anyone wishing to address council regarding any agenda item? Please step forward to the microphone, state your name and address, and please try to limit your comments to three minutes. Okay, seeing none, we will move on. Uh, moving to, um, I will entertain a motion for approval of the consent agenda. So moved. What? Brandon Horst de Young, any discussion? I, I just want to make a comment. I really appreciate the detail of all the minutes that come through there. And the policy and planning was pretty robust, and uh, you have a lot. And also, all the other committees, too. They were very uh, easy to understand and like you were in the room. So, thanks to all who did that. Okay. All in favor of the motion, please say yes. Opposed, no. Mandy, please call the roll. Green Horse? Yes. Young? Yes. Amstrup? Yes. Four? Yes. Motion passed. Moving on, public hearing regarding his rezoning application for 1112 uh, one, East 3rd Street. Mike? Yes, Mr. Mayor, I'd be happy to explain this item. And for those in attendance and those watching at home, I'd like to direct your attention to the big board. Tonight's rezoning request uh, comes to us from Mr. Russ Van Wyck. It's for 112 East 3rd Street. And specifically what Mr. Van Wyck is requesting is a zoning change from M2, that would be our heavy industrial zone, to CC, which is the community commercial. Now, to orientate where this property is located up here on the map, we have Oskaloosa Street straight to the north. I believe East 3rd Street is located right here, highlighted properties, the yellow uh, yellow highlighted property is located right here, <coughs> and then we also have Carson Street that's located right over here. Mandy, let's go ahead, please. Now, as we stated, Mr. Van White um, proposes a single-family and two-family home. It's uh, staff's understanding on this property. Now, currently, it's important to know that this property is currently zoned M2, which is the city's heavy industrial zone. The map that's showing up on the big board is a zoning map of the area. The green, highlight green area, I believe, is CC, so it's community commercial, and M2 is highlighted in the pink area. And as you can see, the yellow highlighted area is currently in the pink area, but also abuts the CC area. So from a zoning standpoint, we do not believe there's any spot zoning associated with this request because community commercial abuts the subject property that we have in front of us this evening. So let's go ahead, please, Mandy. Now, as far as the future use land map of the comprehensive plan, it is also important to understand that this is used as a guide and it's generally referred to as the general area. So even though we do have parcel by parcel highlights here, once again, uh, what was identified in the comprehensive plan for that property was residential, that you have a low density residential, but it also is abutted in the comprehensive plan by CC, which is community commercial as well. So let's go ahead, please, Mandy. Now, in evaluating this request along with the applicant's proposed use for the property, we do believe that the proposed rezoning is in line with the city's comprehensive plan. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to also point out that the Planning and Zoning Commission unanimously approved this request after June 26th meeting. And with that, staff is recommending approval this evening. All right, thank you, Mike. Uh, Mandy, any written comments? No written comments. Council, comments? I, I have a comment. Um, I wanted to. I think Russ is probably, yeah. there you are. How are you? Great, how are good you? Good to see you. I'm good. I want to thank you for this project. That was a heavily blighted area, and the fact that you're breathing new life into that area, um, I'm exceptionally grateful to that. And a piece of information 
that isn't on there, Russ is actually having high school students um, in the trade schools come in and learn about construction on the construction of this property. So I feel like it's a huge win uh, for everyone involved, and I wanted to personally thank you for taking this on. Thank you, Linda. Sure. Okay, anything else? Okay, any comment from a member member of the audience on related to this? <clears throat> All right, and that I'll entertain a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. For it. Young Branderhorst, any discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say yes. Opposed, no. Mandy, please call the roll. Young. Yes. Greenerhorst. Yes. Sandstrom. Yes. Four. Yes. Motion passed. Moving on to the ordinance number one zero two seven, entitled an ordinance, ordinance amending the zoning ordinance of the city of Pella, Iowa, by amending the boundaries of the CC district to include the property generally located at one twelve East Third Street, and directing the planning and zoning director to note the ordinance number and date of this change on the official zoning map. This is the first reading. Assume there's nothing to add. Uh, so, correct, Mike? Yeah. That is correct, sir. So I will entertain a motion for approval. So moved. Brander Horse for any discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say yes, oppose no. Mandy, please call the roll. Brander Horst? Yes. For? Yes. Young? Yes. Answer. Abstain, conflict of interest. <coughs> motion passes. Uh, we will not be able to um, motion for waiving the readings because we don't have five people here. So We'll move on to resolution number 6603 entitled resolution consenting to the placement of wireless sub support structures adjacent to municipal parks or residential lots. Mike? I guess, Mr. Mayor, I'd be happy to explain this item. And once again, I'd like to refer everyone's attention to the board. <laughs> Mayor Gaward stated uh, this request comes to us tonight from U.S. Cellular, and specifically what they're looking to do is place uh, three 5G wireless support structures near a municipal park and also near a residential property. It is important to know from Council's perspective, we did discuss this request during policy planning on July 5th, and Council directed staff to place this resolution that we're considering tonight for formal consideration. Now, as the city code requires, when we talk about wireless facilities that are going to be located near municipal parks or residential lots, they specifically must receive council approval, and that is the purpose of tonight's resolution. So let's go ahead, please, Mandy, and show the location of these uh, wireless structures that we have here. Um, they are listed up here on the big board, but they are generally in these red highlighted or circled areas that we have along with the addresses. Those would be the three locations of the wireless structures. And we also have pictures of what the pole is before and the after with the wireless structure as well. So let's go ahead, please, Mandy. Now, in summary, based on Council's direction on July 5th, staff is recommending approval of this resolution, which allows the poles to be placed in the three locations that we've discussed this evening. And so with that, Mr. Mayor, I believe that concludes the staff presentation. This evening, we more to answer questions the Council may have on this item. All right, thank you, Mike. Can I get a motion for approval? So moved. The young is for. Any discussion? <coughs> okay, all in favor, please say yes. Oppose no. Mandy, please call the roll. The young? Yes. For? Yes. Brainerhorst? Yes. Answer. Yes. Motion passed. <coughs> resolution number 6604 entitled Resolution Adopting Revised Personal Policy Manual. Mike? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Once again, it is important to note that we did discuss these changes during policy and planning on July 5th, and I would say a fair way to summarize the proposed changes is these are housekeeping items, and they just meant to clarify and align the city's personnel policy to what's actually happening in the operations of the city. But as we discussed, um, we do have listed on and included in, in the staff memo the various changes that are being proposed this evening. We do not believe any of the proposed changes are material. They're simply housekeeping items. Mandy, let's go ahead to the second slide, please. And with that, Mr. Mayor, we are recommending approval of this resolution as well. All right, thank you, Mike. Can I get a motion for approval? So moved. Mr. Right. Horst DeYoung, any discussion? Mm -hmm. Okay, all in favor, please say yes. Opposed, no. Mandy, please call the roll. Greener Horst? Yes. DeYoung? Yes. Answer? Yes. Four? Yes. Motion passed. 
Moving on, resolution number 6605, entitled Resolution Approving Change Order Number 1 for the 2022 Sidewalk Repair Project. Mike? Oh, yes, Mr. Mayor, I'd be happy to explain this item. This resolution approves change order number one for the 2022 sidewalk repair project. And what we have listed up on the bulletin board is this year's sidewalk improvement program. And generally speaking, it is in the southwest quadrant of our city, which would be south of Washington Street and west of Main Street. And what the purpose of the change order tonight is, as in the city owned sidewalk panels that are in need of replacement this evening. So let's add uh, this, this part of the project, rather. So let's go ahead, please, uh, Mandy. Now, as you can see, what we have up here listed is the location of the sidewalks that abut city property on there and our responsibility under the sidewalk replacement pro project. So it's about $16,244 on it. The price per square foot of the replacement of the sidewalk panels or the square foot is $15.50. Now, if approved, the contract for the city sidewalk repair project could be increased up to $111,724. I believe that concludes the staff presentation this evening. Be more than happy to answer your questions on this item. All right, thank you, Mike. Can I get a motion for approval? So moved. Support. The young Brandon Horse discussion. As a as a avid walker around this community, I appreciate this program. Our sidewalks <laughs> are in much better shape than they were three, four years ago. <clears throat> Old guy like me, he's got to worry about tripping and falling. All right, all in favor, please say yes, oppose no. Mandy, please call the roll. Young? Yes. Brainerhorst? Yes. Sandstra? Yes. Four? Yes. Motion passed. Moving on, resolution number 6606, entitled Resolution Approving and Authorizing the Execution of a Real Estate mm -hmm. Gift Agreement with RDP Holdings, LLC. Mike? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd be happy to explain this item. As Mayor Ward stated, what we're actually entertaining this evening is a real estate gift agreement from RDP. And the best way to explain this item is this is property that RDP owns and that's what's considered in the public right away, but the public right away is via easement. So they're needing this property to the city. And it's the purple highlighted area that you see out here. And then generally the property abuts Washington Street, Highway G28. Ultimately, what we plan to do long term is annex property around this area. And as part of the annexation, the roadway control is going to be very important. So this uh, this gift agreement or a gift from RDP is going to help facilitate the city's long-term plans with that. So basically that is the explanation on it. It's the north side of the right-of-way on Washington Street and it's the purple highlight <coughs> area up there. So Mr. Mayor, we are recommending approval this evening. All right, thank you. Can I get a motion for approval? So moved. Score. The young score, any discussion? The day is soon coming when that needs to be relayed. Okay. All in favor, please say yes. Oppose no. Mandy, please call the roll. Young? Yes. Score? Yes. Ranger Horse? Yes. Ian Strack? Yes. Motion passed. Moving on, resolution number 6607, entitled Resolution Approving Permanent and Temporary Easements and a Quick Claim Deed for the Monroe Street Improvements, Prairie Street Improvements, and 218th Avenue and Neal Drive Reconstruction Project. Hi, yes, Mr. Mayor, and it's Mayor Dwarf stated this uh, resolution actually approves temporary and permanent easements for the Monroe Street um, gravel to uh, city, urban city street upgrade project, along with the 218th Street upgrade, as well as the Prairie Street update. Now, as far as the payments to the proposed uh, to the property owners, they total $2,250, and they are necessary to complete these projects. Um, so, Danny, I don't know if there's anything else to add. Covered it. Okay. I've been sitting on my desk for a while doing some cleanup. All right. Well, that concludes the staff presentation. Mr. Mayor, I'm recommending approval of the resolution this right. evening. Thank you, Mike. Can I get a motion for approval? So moved. Support. Brandon Horace Banster. Any discussion? I'll wait till. Uh... You grew by one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so all in favor, please say yes, oppose no. Mandy, please call the roll. Greener Horst? Yes. Ian Strack? Yes. Carlstone? Yes. Four? Yes. Ian? Yes. Motion passed. Abstract of bills number 2131. Can I get a motion for approval? Move to approve and issue warrants. Support. Greener Horst, Banstra. 
Any discussion, questions? Okay, all in favor, please say yes, vote no. Mandy, please call the roll. Rainer Horst? Yes. Anstra? Yes. Armstrong? Yes. Ford? Yes. Dion? Yes. Motion passed. Any council member have any other business you want to address us with this evening? I, I do. I brought a little bit of show and tell. Um, last week, or, or the last meeting, Mr. Young asked about uh, Big Rock Park. And I gave a brief update on Big Rock Park. And then uh, last week, I also met with the lead scientist on the environmental study on Big Rock Park. And I had uh, mentioned in chambers that they're hiding hand-blown glass orbs in the park and um, on the back side of the orbs there is they're all numbered and they are dated and they say big rock park on them um, the things that are happening in that park are phenomenal the things <coughs> that the scientists are uncovering in the park are just very humbling to me to understand what endangered species are growing uh, and, and thriving within this savanna <coughs> ecosystem that we host in our community. So I brought this just as a follow-up and um, I'll just kind of pass it down. It, it's very interesting, they're interesting and you are all invited to go into the park and those are hidden somewhere in the park. It's just up to you to find them and when you find them, they're yours to keep. Is there not a website to go on to, to register? At Friends of Big Rock Park. Yes, thank you for asking. Are they easier to find than more else? Uh, <laughs> well, to me, I think they're more exciting to find. <laughs> How many of them are out there? I, I not, that is number 11. So I'm sure that um, as soon as I give that back to them, uh, it will be hidden. Oh, I thought you were out scouring looking. Oh, no. <laughs> so they gave it to you? Don't, well, I, don't, I don't get to keep it. I don't get to keep it. Okay. All right. Thanks, Lynn. Yeah, it's kind of cool. Yeah. Anything else? Anyone? Okay. Uh, any member of the public have any other business you'd like to address the council with tonight? If you would, please come forward with the microphone. State your name and address, and please limit your comments to three minutes. Okay, seeing none, we will move uh, into a policy and planning session. We're going to start with a community center renovation project update. Okay, yes, Mr. Mayor, I'll lead off before we turn the floor over to our representative from Shummer and Associates this evening. But the purpose of tonight's um, discussion is to update the council regarding the community center renovation project. Specifically, we're going to be talking about the proposed future use plan for the community center as well. Now, as council is aware, in April of this year, we did approve an engineering agreement with Schumer and Associates to conduct an architectural and engineering services for the project. As a part of that, um, was also to develop a future use plan for the, for the community center as well. And that's what we're really here tonight to get direction from council on as well. Now, as a part of the process, they did conduct, the, the community center ad hoc committee conducted both a public meeting and also submitted a questionnaire out to the community. I believe the entire questionnaire was included in the council packet. But as far as the top responses from the community survey that came back, the number one uh, request was gym space or an open indoor space for kids to play. On at number two was expanded art programming from the city of Pella. And number three was the importance of historic preservation, especially in our town town. So let's go ahead, please, Mandy. Now a little bit of um, just to base everyone so we're all on the same page going forward. Um, when we discussed the city's long-term facilities plan, which consisted of two projects, one was the community center project, the existing community center. The second was the city's proposed indoor recreation center facility. Uh, Facility. For the community center, we established a base budget of five and a half million dollars for the project. And as you can see, what the city felt the five and a half million dollars were, were to address these items that we have right here. Now, at the time, I believe we had a preliminary cost estimate, which, which is called the base plan, of roughly four point three million dollars. Now, Shemmer is here tonight to talk about additional details on the, both the base plan 
as well as a future use plan that could be, I believe is being commonly referred to as the base plan plus on it. So, Mandy, let's go ahead, please. Okay, and with that, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to go ahead and turn the floor over to Mr. John Bloom of Shemmer and Associates uh, to lead us through the, tonight's discussion. Okay. with uh, Shemmer Associates out of Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, before I begin the presentation, I just want to mention some of the programming that's currently going on at uh, the Fall Community Center. It's home to the Popular Arts Center program for children and adults. Uh, Crossroads has a lot of social services for the community. Uh, there's an auditorium that the Union Street Players and other groups hold very popular events throughout the year. Uh, the Community Services Office is, is currently in there. The Dark Department of Depart the DOT is in there if you get a license plate or a driver's license. There's a public art gallery, and there's currently a gym that has been open for several years, and, and I'm sure there's much more. Um, so for the last several months, our group has been working with the uh, Public Community Center Ad Hoc Committee to develop a plan for future use of the facility and uh, to make recommendations on how to move forward with this project. So in the beginning, uh, when we started meeting, our goals for that committee were to uh, enhance the current users of the Public Community Center. Um, we want to increase usage and then we want to uh, support uh, Did you turn the TV on? Support solutions that are financially feasible. So with that, I'm going to go to the next slide. Um, with that, we <coughs> advertised and held a public meeting in May where we asked, uh, here we are right here, the public meetings of the Community Center, where we asked the uh, public questions like what new programming you'd like to see in the community center or what, what can be enhanced in existing programming. And we also ask questions like what, what can we do to this building that will make it more desirable to go to the community center. We also held an online survey. We had about 199 responses to that, asking similar questions about what would you like to see happen in the community center and some other data-driven questions. You can see here at the top, there's a couple you know, indoor kids, what Mike mentioned before, the art center programs are some popular items at the top. And we had somebody at the end of it who was not in favor of the project. So only one out of 199, but <laughs> just, that's pretty good. Um, so what is the public meeting? Sort of repeating a few things that Mike said. Let's go to the next slide. Hey, can you hang on a second? Yeah. Are you picking it up at all? I know it's difficult when you got to look that oh, way. I'm sorry. Yeah, we'll just we'll just spin this whole thing. Yeah, we can help it. We need to try to keep you in the mic. So. How about that? Sure. Thanks. There we go. Thanks. Look for the address your comment to the council. <laughs> You're good. Just address it into the microphone. I was a little worried about that when I saw the setup. So I know I've been here three times now. Uh, so public input results, let's go to the next one. Uh, the number one result was to reopen the gym for uh, non-competitive activities. We want to use this as sort of a multi-purpose space, not for competitive sports or basketball tournaments on the weekend. Uh, and this is, and that, and that one is really not that uh, expensive of an endeavor here. But really, if you look at the gym here, um, the floor is good. It's really, we have some abatement issues and tile falling from the ceiling, so that needs to be replaced. But that is not an expensive effort to get that gym necessarily reopened. This is a lot better, so. Um, expanded enhanced art programming. Um, a lot for that survey. We heard a lot of uh, talk about makerspace, and that could really be anything. That could be high tech or low tech um, uh, spaces. We also talked about, we also wanted to see more expanded adult classes and possibly rentable artist studio spaces. Um, the, I mean, the photography studio, uh, the expanded senior activities, what we got, from my notes, we have 
better seating, bocce ball, possibly like a tool checkout, sort of fits into the makerspace sort of uh, category as well. Um, improved accessibility was a, a major topic that came out. Currently, uh, the main entrance into the public community center is a, is a ramp. It's sort of hidden behind some, tre some trees coming off the alley, and the ramp is just uh, doesn't meet current ADA requirements. And all the restrooms throughout the building are very dated and don't also don't meet the ADA requirements. Um, current ADA requirements. Uh, certified Kitchen was another one that men was mentioned a lot. People want to see potentially cooking classes or uh, communal use for maybe uh, family reunions or the scouts come in and have a dinner. They also mentioned that um, maybe vendors like during tulip time could possibly use this kitchen and other events throughout the year. Uh, another item not listed here is auditorium improvements. Uh, they think it could be uh, uh, some changes could be made to make it more accommodating for multiple users. Uh, that could be done with uh, uh, some reconfiguration to uh, adding dressing rooms that could be used for multiple users and some equipment and some balcony reconfigurations and better ADA uh, uh, seating. So I'll go to the next slide. So that gets us to uh, the public community center and uh, community recommendations. So what you're looking at here is what Mike was referring to as the 2020 um, cost estimate from SEH Engineering, and this sort of outlines what we're calling base bed scope of work, which is to us uh, essentially a deferred maintenance project. So, um, so this was this was made in 2020, but I think the City Council approved the 5.5 million dollars in 2021 or 22. But we're basing our base bed options, our base bed design on on this study. So, what does that mean? Um, a lot of these items that are on that were mentioned in part of the public input as well. So accessibility, we we're gonna provide a new ADA ramp into the building and try to provide more of a prominent entrance. That also includes, um, that also includes elevator modernization. There's currently an elevator there now that uh, accesses the ground floor to the third floor, but it does not get to the gym level. Uh, so, and I'll get to a plan later where we're showing how to provide ADD accessibility to that gym level. It also includes updating uh, restrooms, signage in the building. Exterior improvements, the next one, the uh, new windows in the space, or new windows around the building. Uh, currently they're over four years old. Um, there is some masonry repair, but it's fairly minor. The building's been kept in very good condition, but then there's some also roof portions of the roof that need replacement as well. Um, gymnasium, of course, in this basement option would be also be reopened. Um, the mechanical, electrical and plumbing, the mechanical systems is, is well beyond its useful life cycle, so the whole, the whole mechanical system would be replaced uh, during this base bed operation. Electrical, uh, electrical lighting systems would be replaced as needed. There have been lighting that has been replaced throughout the years, and so some of that will be kept so whatever, whatever needs to be upgraded will be upgraded. So the whole building gets touched, you'll see, but, but uh, when I show you the floor plans later, there's just a couple areas that we want to focus a little bit on. And the plumbing, we mentioned that the, the bathrooms would be remodeled, so that takes care of the plumbing. And then we're uh, and that also in the base bit of a fire sprinkler system would be installed. So this is a masonry building on the outside, on the outside but the rest of it is basically a lot of wood construction, so there's quite a bit of fuel there, so this is definitely an improvement. So I'm going to go to the next slide and show what that looks like on the floor plan. So I know this is it's sort of a complex <coughs> building to understand. Um, so, but I, I'm not going to get in the weeds here. But so this is this is the gym level. Let's just say this is the ground level, second floor, third floor. So the colored areas represent. Like I said, the whole building sort of gets touched because we're doing a mechanic and electrical improvement, but the colored areas represent areas that we're either moving pieces around to make what we think better efficiencies and um, other things. So if I start at the ground floor, um, we proposing, we're proposing to, to move the community service offices down into the southeast corner. So that we want to make this, because we're doing a new ADA ramp, we want to make this more of the main entry. And by putting the community service offices in the southeast corner, they sort of have sort of this access control to see who comes in and out of the building right now. 
Currently, their offices are way in the back here and then on the second floor. So, and the entrances, there's sort of five entrances in this building. So we, we sort of want, we want to funnel people into the main entrance in the southeast corner for security, people, keeping people who shouldn't be in there out. Uh, the blue areas just represent bathroom remodeling in place. So some of these bathrooms would have to be larger to meet ADA requirements. Um, but the, um, and then the purple areas here, since we've, we've, we've came, if you go in this space right now, this is sort of uh, rabbit worn. Just a lot of smaller rooms, inefficient, and they're very inefficiently laid out. When we move some of these pieces around, we just found that we have what we're calling flex space for potential future programming. Um, as we mentioned, maybe coming from ideas from the public input, but right now we're just calling it flex space where we don't have current programming. And, before, and then the, oh, and we'll talk about access to the gym. Currently, there is no accessible route to the gym. There's, you can walk down these bleachers from these stairs, but there's really no good way to get into it um, accessibly. So what we're proposing, and, the, and this was also proposed in the SEH report earlier, was to put a, a LULA, which is a limited use, limited application elevator. So it would just basically be installed on the ground level, and then it would go down to the gym level to provide that accessibility for the gym. Gymnasium, or we call it the multi-purpose room. So uh, let's go and uh, before we go to the next slide. So that's the base bid option. That's really everything that was on the report from the SEH in the two, in 2020. Um, we're also working with the friends of the Pella Community Center who want to they, they want to get this base bid work done, but then they also want to raise private fund do some fundraising privately to go beyond this base bid scope of work. And so what I want to show you next is what we call the base bid plus option. So uh, as I mentioned before, this is, this is sort of the main entry in the building. It's sort of tucked behind these trees with, there's an elevator here and then this ramp, this steep ramp into the building. What we're proposing is on this, and that's the southeast corner right here. What we're proposing is to demo the existing elevator, which only goes to the ground floor, does not go to the basement. And and add a new addition that includes an elevator, a stair, and sort of a lobby area. And then we have a new ADA ramp that comes down to uh, Union Street where we have accessible parking stalls here. And so um, I think we can go to the next plan here. Oh, this, is a, uh, this is our preliminary rendering of what that could look like. So currently what we'd be doing is carving out a portion of this hill, removing some trees, and trying to create a new main entry into the public community center that you know provides a lot more uh, daylight, is a very visible main entry into the building, and gives it a new uh, uh, a new feel for the a new face, a new facade for the for the community center. And out here we have we're just sort of showing like a courtyard area, and this could be like a donor wall or donor bricks or something something like that. But this is. This is the first rendering of it, so what you'd walk up through here, and we're, whatever we can't make up in a slight gray, we, we would have to end up doing sort of a ramp here to get up to the main entry, which is right here in between the existing building and the new addition. So that's, that's our new main entry right here, and we have an elevator that would go from the third floor all the way down to the gymnasium level, also with a stair as well. They could, access, they could get all the way down to the floor to the lower level, and I'll show you how here in a second, how that's accomplished. Uh, next slide. So this is the floor plan with the base bid plus option. There's a little bit more color on this one. Um, I wanna focus a little bit on that addition we just talked about. So this is the basement, ground level, second floor, third floor. So as you can see, this is the addition right here. So it's located in that southeast corner, works pretty well, the existing corridor locations, that all, that's all efficient, makes sense. Um, on the ground floor, we're doing the same thing. We talked about moving the community service offices into the southeast corner so that we can create, um, we, they can see who's coming in and out of the building at all times. And, and then if you'll notice here, we've removed, there was an original stair right here, we've removed that, so we've captured some more floor, floor area on a couple of the floors. So we've captured this floor. So we don't need another stair, even if we have 
350 people or so in 23 stairs by code is enough to allow it. And this new stair will be built, you know, two modern codes. So I'm gonna talk about the stair. The thing that makes this possible, the, the other thing, good thing about this the location of this elevator and stair is if you go down in this area here, this is sort of the boiler room, this sort of Freddy Krueger dungeon area, but but right here, there's a big fan, and it, it, it's connected to like a four foot by four foot wide duct that runs down this hall, this, this corridor right here. And so since in the base pit, we're replacing all mechanical equipment, that now opens up this corridor, which happens to be, it's 10 feet wide by 10 feet tall, and it just so happens to be on the level of the gymnasium floor. So now we put our elevator, our new stair here, and now we have direct access with a stair and accessible accessibility with an elevator right into this gymnasium. And then, so that's sort of the main thing. The, the other two items here, so the three items that I, I think we're proposing is this new addition, elevator stair addition. Um, we want to get the certified kitchen in the basement plus option, and then we also have some other uh, remodeling areas that we want to talk about. So I'll talk about those here. Let's talk about the community center moving locations. We want, there's existing windows that open up down into the gymnasium right here, and we just want to reopen those up so the community service now has access to people coming in and, and to whatever is happening in the gymnasium. So this, this location is important, plus the community center also helps uh, hurt the cats during the art center programming, I guess. <laughs> um, the second floor, uh, well, I'm going to talk about these blue areas. The blue areas, again, just represent bathroom remodels. And in this, in this floor plan, we've just stacked all those in the southeast corner for efficiency. Um, the Union Street players, I, I mentioned before the Union Street players are in here, and then uh, they, they currently occupy space right here, which is a little inconvenient because the public comes in, the space goes in the theater, mostly through this area here. So what we propose to do is move them to this northeast corner where we used to have bathrooms and uh, community service office, so they have better access to the back of house here, back to the theater. Uh, the kitchen is currently here. It's been decommissioned long ago, and we proposed that we have a new certified kitchen just back in this location. It still makes sense, connected to the meeting room. Um, you'll see most, there is a lot more purple areas, which would represent flex space. Uh, as I mentioned before, we picked up a little bit of square footage, and we made some areas on the lower levels more efficient, so now we have uh, what we call flex space for potential future programming, and we haven't identified exactly what that means yet. And uh, we found a little flex space up here on the third floor as well. Um, restroom access off the lobby? Restroom access off the lobby. Oh, yes. We were creating this lobby here, too. And have, when, when you're in there now, this lobby can serve for kids waiting for rides home. And then we can also create access off through from that lobby into the, the restrooms. And these are just, I mean, this is very preliminary work here. These are solid colors. We don't have the plumbing fixtures and all the doors work uh, yet here. We want to get approval on on this, on, the, on going forward with this base bid plus option. Um, go to the next slide. I just want to reiterate here, too, once again, that the you know, base bid, the Friends of Pelican Community Center is committed to getting that, that deferred maintenance work done, and then what they want to do is, get, so that's the improved accessibility, the exterior improvements, gymnasium reopened, mechanical electrical plumbing work, and the basement plus is, is based off of fundraising to do this new elevator addition, new elevator stair, main entry addition, the certified kitchen, and then the additional interior remodeling that I mentioned before. So I, that is what I have to present. I'd be glad to ask questions, unless Arvin, do you have anything more you want to add? No, I think you covered it very well. So thank you. Open it up with that one. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for, for that I presentation. I know Dave was on the team and he's not here, so can't really get his comment. I guess I have a couple questions. The, uh, the numbers that you showed simply were the 2020 numbers with no update done, right? Correct. Uh, so and you haven't done any cost estimates? 
We've heard this you, base, but we've talked about five point five million dollars being committed from the city. Do you feel that covers the, the base bid? We've reviewed those numbers and understand that there's been inflation and escalation over the cut, and that the numbers still look reasonable. And I think after this, I mean, moving forward, we we will be digging more into that. We we've, we've roughly looked at the square footage numbers and agreed that those, with some escalation, would be appropriate. And I think we sort of assumed the 5.5 million accounted for that 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 was given in 2020. That report was given in 2020. So, yeah. um, but we've we've looked at yeah, like I said, a square footage amount for the mechanical, and, and some of the numbers I think are uh, potentially light, just depending on options. So, but I think our plan moving forward would be to push to a pricing set, uh, hand it to our uh, estimating consultant, while fundraising's in parallel, and then see where we we're at. And then if we have to cut back, we cut back, and then we're probably back here again telling you where we're at. <laughs> so, but I, I, I imagine that'll take a few months. Okay, any thoughts, counsel? Well, I think um, this building reminds me a lot of Big Rock Park. There's a lot of treasures in there, and there is an extensive history in that building. And I can honestly say that the reopening of the gym is probably in the top five things that citizens ask me about. And it's never if it's going to be open, it's when is it going to be open. And so I. I think that the community has a, a huge interest in this as well. So um, I appreciate you bringing us up to date on things. I appreciate your fundraising efforts. Um, and I just think this is a project, again, that is very valuable to our community. Yes, uh, one question I had was, with, you mentioned things like the certified kitchen and then the, the senior activities. I don't know how long it's been, but this used to be the location for senior meals, mm -hmm. if I re remember. And I know Oskaloosa has it and Knoxville has it, and I'm not quite sure of the reason that it was dropped from Pella. Is there any way that this renovation would be able to bring that back? Or is that a, from a different whole funding source that we're prohibited from that? I can answer that because I was president of the board of the public health and talked to them all the time. The public health is in charge of that. They've made other arrangements. <coughs> and it was closed down. Oh, I'm sorry. Public health is in charge of that, and they have made other arrangements. And uh, there won't be a chance to bring it back in there. There won't be a chance? No. Huh. Not, not the way it stands right now. The facility can support it, but the county isn't doing that program anymore. No, she, they've made other arrangements, right. and uh, it, the majority of that went to the well, along with their clients. So um, it's a it's a separate entity, completely from the city or, or the county. It's the public health that's in charge, and they're in charge of funding us. Why I've got you. <laughs> Those restrooms on the on the on the new entrance, they'll they'll be public restrooms, really easily accessible public restrooms, which would solve one of the city's problems, mm -hmm. and it'd be overseen by the, the uh, staff there to be watching it, and it would have a male, female, and a, a family restroom, so it would be open. Well, that solution, would that be locked offable from the rest of the center then on to a time? So that new chamber that has these <coughs> open three stories of restrooms for public, is that, I see the gray hallways on the diagram, obviously we wouldn't want the visitors roaming the building. I mean, well, I assume so, John. Yeah, access I mean, the, control? the access control, we could yeah. probably lock down just that, that room. Um, 
Be yeah, like I mean, six, we have doors here, we have doors here, here, and then it's there, so we can limit access even to the stair at certain times. Not out of the stair, of course, but into the stair. But. Um, it would provide a lot of security. Um, the access would only be access only. And uh, I know Mary at the Art Center, if kids come and go out, all every orifice in the building, <laughs> and it's almost all they can do to keep track of every, all the kiddos. This would also prevent people from going up to the third floor um, if there was something going on up there through crossroads. So crossroads could be opened on the third floor, but people wouldn't be able to get to the first floor or the second floor. So as I understand it, we can lock off different floors from the elevator, right? Yes, yes. I mean, as long as we have a path to get out of the building always. But yeah. We could, at times, you know, be on a timer or whatever, but we could lock doors from accessing other levels of the building. And we're really just trying to funnel everybody into that main entry, and not the back door or the west door or the two <coughs> old main entry doors, the original main entry doors. So the, the whole proposal to add on to the west side, that, that's all gone? That's gone. It's, it's not economically feasible. They discovered <coughs> they discovered that concrete hallway. hallway on the first on the ground floor on the basement floor. It was actually used to maintain the old elevator. They went underneath the old elevator to maintain it. So there's space all the way down to the basement level. That's where the new elevator goes to the basement level, and then right up that corridor into the gym. It's just a beautiful option. So we didn't even know it was there. Yeah, and it's a 10 by 10 concrete <laughs> corridor. Oh. <laughs> Who knew? Who knew? Yeah. I believe, yeah, I think when we did the 1980s elevator, they were still, that mechanical equipment was still in use that's in there. And so that's, I'm assuming that's why they didn't take it all the way down. So. And I wouldn't presume to speak for Dave Hopkins, but the, he and a, several members of the ad hoc committee on the first meeting said they wanted a wow factor. <laughs> and we were, we were concerned because it's an old building. They didn't want it to look like a school. Well, it's an old school. We can't do it. <laughs> but this provides a, an incredible wow factor. And the new entrance. Yeah. The and new also with the, the, the common plaza in the front. And we also found out from Mike at our last meeting that you guys have approved upgrading that alley. Mm -hmm. So that'll just all fit beautifully and together. So the, that addition kind of where you see the stairs, is that just stairs? Um, the glass through the glass? Oops. Yes. Yes. Okay, so it's the elevator with the, the stairs are just in the glass area. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah you just kind of see through here. Because it does look great. I mm -hmm. really like Well, that. and what's really nice with them stacking the restrooms, not only are the public restrooms, yeah but that'll be a small lobby area on each floor, and then all the restrooms will open out onto that lobby. So it'll be, it'll be real convenient, and then that brand new restroom is up. I assume all the stakeholders, Union Street, Crossroads, they've seen this, and they like, uh, to me it seems very consolidated to move people together for the same entity, I like that. Uh, Union Street gets Union the Street's stage, been really busy, stage. and Amanda's been representing them, and they've been really busy. And we didn't want to pass this around too much until you guys have seen it. Uh, the ad hoc's seen it, and, and friends of the Public Community Center have seen it. And we plan on distributing it as soon as you approve this. <laughs> and I've, I've sat down with Union Street and they've looked at it, and they actually gain about 100 square feet in, this, in, in the changes there on the base plus. And um, I think with the flex, between the flex space and putting the air area back space, it allows the audience to have better um, access in and access out into the bathrooms <coughs> during shows. They, given the, but obviously there's a lot of things we'd like to do if we had, you know, <laughs> 10 times the budget. In a, different, in a different building. <laughs> but given the constraints that we have, I think all of the stakeholders we've talked to have been really, really, especially with that base plus option, been really, really happy. 
not to get too minutia here, that there's one green block on the second floor that looks like the paint studio. All the other green blocks are on ground level. Is that intentional or is that, could it be, I don't know. Mary? We, we use that as a, a flex space. Uh, so the thought process is uh, we could, we can share that space. But we do, the Art Center does lose a lot of our storage space as well. So we wanted to make sure that we had the flexibility to have extra um, classes and um, space for parties. We, we double, triple book parties a lot. So by having extra spaces, we can bring more revenue in that way and give the people that what they're wanting is more birthday parties and such. And now I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Don was asking about the, the, the 2020 um, estimate versus now, and you, you think that the 5.5, we can get that as part of the package, but that covers that. Have there been any estimates mm -hmm. on the new plus since the west side has gone away? On the new plus, yes. uh, you know, square footage, cost per square foot estimates for new addition. Uh, if that new addition is approximately uh, 2,500 square feet, you take that times five, 550, dollars square foot, and then you're at like 1.4 million, somewhere in there. And then additional interior remodeling, I think we were throwing two. 50, 300 square foot about it. So I think the the goal for the fundraising effort was around three to five million. And I think I think that gets us in the ballpark where we want to be for the base plus option mm -hmm. along with the five point five. But it's we are eager to get a little more ink on paper to tighten that those numbers up. Tighten those numbers up. Basically what would happen is we take a look at the different enhancements and prioritize them and decide what we could afford to do based on our fundraising ability. We'd love to be able to do it all, but we'll find the most important ones to make sure those get done first. Also we're working on grants and we've already gotten a grant, generous grant from Marion County and from the <coughs> Hello Foundation for the Heritage Gym. So some of the things we'll raise and I, I we want to have the historic building. We want the windows to match what it was historically because it looks so much better looking. So th that's an option for um, the things we're gonna do on the outside of the building is an option to go and, and, and get grants and, and things like that um, for preservation. So we, we will be giving as much money, not just for the, the, this, but as much to the, the we've already got a, over $10,000 for the, the gym and planning on going for more. Can we see that rendering again with the, with the existing building to show the windows? So yeah, the white windows in the original building, that's, that's close to the original configuration, then it's kind of hard to see where it's at right now. But those windows they put in in, in the 80s were, they were nice windows, but uh, they, they didn't match the historical profile that we're proposing here. We noticed when Wayne refurbished the um, front doors, and we had a discussion about painting them white as opposed to another color, and he said that's the color they were. And it, the transoms, and now it, it makes the architecture pop if you have the white authentic windows. There'll be reproductions and done for modern things. Also, um, on the gym, on the west side, they boarded over those windows and those were original windows. You open those windows up and put real windows in there that'll lighten up the gym, the heritage gym, and the windows behind the uh, bleachers uh, were boarded up and, and covered over. And if you open those up, that'll make the gym, it won't change the character. In fact, it'll improve the character, the historic character, but it, it'll lighten it up. Hey, Patty, I mean, this is maybe a question. 
question for you, or maybe Jim that, I'm not sure. So obviously we're talking rec center with gyms also. So mm -hmm. talking about this gym here, I would just like to hear in case I get questions, why a gym in the community center? What, you know, what will, how will those activities look different? What, tell me more about that. And, and Dave pointed out for us, Dave Hopkins, in our ad hoc meeting, really we're just looking to reopen that space, make it safe, a safe public space. It's a public recreational space, not a competitive. And if you take a look at the plans, you'll see the locker rooms aren't being, no showers are being added. In fact, it's being used for storage with a restroom. But a place where families can go, where kids can go after school like they used to do, where uh, if you're having a social gathering, you can use the dining room upstairs with the kitchen and send the kids downstairs. A place the seniors could go to, to for non-competitive activity. So it's just to make the space safe and usable again. Thank you. So I do hoops are uh, still? No, the, yeah, we're, we're hoping that somebody will donate retractable hoops. <laughs> <laughs> But it's the Heritage Gym, it's the only room in the building inside the wheel and then it's still like it was when it was first built. So we would be preserving the, the, the character and uh, the, the bleachers and all that by improving it, but also just flexible space, even if you wanted to, if somebody wanted to donate it, you could put a, a covering, a mobile covering floor over the, the gym and, and do other activities. As well, you know, they had dances and they had the the library has things that they do like yoga and stuff that, that they do with their programs. So that's really that's just a it recreational is. space. It's, it's it, called it the Heritage Gym, but it's not a gym. Yeah, sure. It also gives you the opportunity to have indoor activities during the bad months, during the winter months, and things like that, like yeah. markets and things can be inside. Mm -hmm. And close to town, well, uh, uh, of course, it's building location, location, location. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. yeah, it's good information. Can we get a sense, is the council comfortable with this direction? We'd like to start fundraising. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Sounds to me like it's a eight and a half to $10 million project. That's what we're estimating. That's what I'm estimating anyway, yes. We have five and a half committed, and we're going to see how much we can push beyond that. And we've got lots of naming opportunities at the council. <laughs> <laughs> we will be coming to the council with requests for naming opportunities. The partnership agreement is being put together. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. All right. Let's uh, move on. Uh, second item on our policy and planning is an update from Mike on, uh, as we're all aware, there's significant property tax legislation passed in this last uh, session of the state legislature that will have an effect on uh, cities moving forward. So Mike thought maybe we should get somewhat of an update of uh, where that's heading as we plan for the future. <coughs> so, Mike? Oh, thanks. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. That was a good introduction to the topic we're discussing this evening. As Mayor Gord stated, the state of Iowa recently passed property tax legislation Tonight's session is really to update council on how it will impact, potentially impact the city of Pella on a go-forward basis. So at any time I move too fast through this, stop me and I'll be happy to explain on it as well. But it's very important to note, when we talk about property tax legislation, we're talking about would be our next fiscal year, so that'd be 2024 through 2025. So when we make that reference, we're talking about the fiscal year that would start on July 1st, 2024. Now, a lot of the information we're showing this evening came straight from the Department of Management on, on here as well. So when we say about intent, this is from the state's perspective on it. Now, one of the items that they talked about with the Department of Management was the goal was to bring all levies back or under the $8.10 max rate. Now, just to explain what we do in Pella is overall, the city's property tax rate has been at $10.20 for the last 22 years. Now that's comprised of what's commonly referred to as your general fund levy, and that rate is $8.10. And 
And then we have some special revenue fund levies, and that's mainly for employee retirement contributions and health insurance. And then we have our debt service levy. You add all three of those together, it's $10.20. What the state is doing when they talk about the $8.10 levy, that's the general fund levy. We levy $8.10. So the legislation that's being proposed by the state of Iowa impacts us. It's about 80% of our levy that we're talking about this evening. And that's why we wanted to make sure that we're all on the same page heading into next budget season on this. Now, one of the things the Department of Management said is they want to consolidate all these levies and bring it back to 810. We're going to go through that here on the following slide. But for now, really how it impacts Pella is when you look at the operational levy and our $8.10 operational levy, what the state's formula is is rather simple. If your valuations increase by more than 3%, so we're talking about taxable valuations in the general fund, so if taxable valuations next July go up by more than 3% over the current year, the state's adopted a funding formula or a formula that rolls back your rate by an equivalent of three, up to 3%. So when you look at property tax legislation and regulation, what they're really concerned about is the total levy amount. And I would say based on my analysis that most years we're gonna be at 3% or under in the general fund just based on this formula that we're talking about here this evening. Now you may say, and I don't want to certainly don't want to be cautious with my words, but when you look at it, just inflationary increases, increases for employees, salary increases, you quickly start to get to that two to three percent. So please keep that in mind, and that's why we're here talking about it on a go-forward basis. But the exact formula is, is if you're less than three percent taxable valuation growth, there's no reduction to your operational levy amount. If you're somewhere between between three and six percent, your operational levy amount is going to be reduced by two percent. If you're greater than six percent, it's going to be reduced by three percent. Now, some of the kinks in the formula, you could be what happens if you're at four percent, the state's going to reduce your operational levy by two percent, so you'll have two percent growth in your total levy for next year on it as well. And that's just one of the nuances in the formula on a go for basis. So we need to keep this in mind, but. Overall, again, the, the emphasis at the state level is they're looking to limit the total levy increases on, on it. So by doing that, if your taxable valuations go up by more than 3%, they will, the formula automatically sets your levy rate and there's reductions on that as well. So before we proceed, is there any questions about the state formula or the intent of it? And what share what our uh, valuation went up this in this last? Rebalance. Okay. Um, in the last rebalance, I'm going to preface my comment for next year. And again, um, we've got preliminary information from Marion County. We also had a TIF district that will expire next year. We've been planning this for years on this TIF district. So our increase for next year went up about 7% taxable growth. What's going to happen, Mr. Mayor, is I believe our $8.10 levy limit will be reduced by. 3%. So you're likely to see an operating levy limit that's going to be set in stone at about $7.85 based on our preliminary analysis. Is this House File 218? Yeah, it's. Yeah. yeah, I remember bringing that to our attention mm -hmm. pre budget meetings. Yeah. So. yeah. Alrighty, so let's go ahead, please, Mandy. So when we talked about the state's perspective from the Department of Management, and they've said all these levies, at Pella, we levy the general fund, uh, general fund levy, that's it on it. Other communities, there's a lot of other levies that are listed up on the board that ultimately over the next three years, the state's gonna combine down, and at the end of the day, by fiscal year 2029, these levies will cease to exist and they'll be down to the $8.10. So for a lot of communities, this is pretty serious. You're levying outside the 10 for any one of these levies. The item that I've highlighted on the board is the emergency levy. And the reason why I put that one on there is when we go through the rating agencies, we'll always talk to the credit folks on how much the city could increase its property tax levy if it had to, if you got into a real emergency. And we've always reserved the emergency levy, that's 27 cents per thousand on it. The state and a lot of communities are at that, they're already levying that 27 cents. We have an impella on that, and um, 
on a go forward basis, the state's uh, plans to remove that levy and just drop back to the 810. So for a lot of communities, we'd be sitting here talking this evening or when they do their budget, that there's actually going to be pretty significant reductions to your operational levy. But for Pella, we use it as just a capacity issue on a go forward basis. But as you can see, there's a number of levies that will be consolidated in future years through the legislation. So let's go ahead, please, Mandy. Okay. Now, as far as the impact to Pella is, when we talk about it, and we don't, we haven't utilized the emergency levy, but from a planning standpoint, when we talk to credit rating agencies, and they've always looked at what happens if something serious happens in Pella, um, one of your, you lose a major employer, what is that analysis? And we have to go through that analysis for bond ratings on here, and we've quite often relied on the emergency levy to say, well, if doomsday happens, the city has at its fingertips, you could have an emergency levy. That's going to cease to exist on it as well. We equated that to about $190,000 annually. Now, item number two, one of the mechanisms that we all need to be aware of is once you have a reduction in your general fund operating levy, it's set in stone. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is if council recalls this current past year, we're talking about the current year we're in, if you recall we talked about the general fund taxable valuations, there was actually a decrease from the prior year before. So if you had a year where your levy goes up, your taxable valuations goes up six or seven percent, you get your operational levy rolled back, it's now less than it was a year before. The following year you lose valuations, your levy stays the same. You cannot increase it. So what I would say is when we've done it for several years at Pella, but long-term financial planning is going to be much more important on a go-forward basis for that very reason that we have. And I would say to mention, the state would tell you that in FY29, they're going to allow entities, if you're below the 810, to catch up one time and go to $8.10. Anyone that's worked in municipal government in Iowa tell you that when you start talking out three to four years and potential property tax rate increases with the state of Iowa, um, subject to change in, in the future. So we need to keep that in mind, but technically they will allow a one-time catch-up to $8.10 uh, in FY29 on it. But again, track history says that's an item that could be very likely to change in the future. So again, this was just a brief presentation on it, but we wanted to make sure council's aware of potential uh, legislation's impact to Pella. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is during the budget session, and some of these items we haven't visited for a while, but it's always a good practice, I'm gonna preface my comments, that you wanna do this regardless if you're facing property tax legislation or not. And what I would say is on a long-term basis, it's probably important that the city consider additional revenue sources, diversification of your general fund revenue base. And so Mandy, if we could go ahead, um, please. But during this upcoming budget session, we just wanted to make sure council's aware that we're likely going to have additional work sessions on these items. But we're gonna look at fees that are in the general fund that support general fund services. We're gonna look at the cost of those services and what the fees cover and the percentage of the cost of the services. And I think this is just good practice to do couple of quick ones that come to mind, but there's others, planning and zoning fees, community services fees. We've talked a lot about ambulance fees on this as well. We also have library fees that we receive payments from the county for use of our libraries. So there's quite a bit of fees associated with the general fund and we're gonna review those along that. And I think that's just good standard procedure regardless on this as well. The other item that these are long-term items, some of them may be short-term adoptions, others could be long-term. We also think it's important that the city look at its franchise fees. Currently, a lot of cities have franchise fees on gas utilities um, and other utilities that operate in the city's right-of-way on it. We haven't necessarily um, adopted those in the past. It's something that we might have to consider in the future on it as well. And the other item that I would have, and I think this is really good, good business practice when you look at it, but Again, when you look at potential annexation areas, one of the things that we need to keep in mind is there's residents that live outside the city of Pella that are receiving city utility services. The city of Pella has incurred a cost in extending those utility services. They're deriving the benefit of utility services. Those areas are areas that we should consider for potential annexation in the future as well. So 
again, when we talk about diversification of your revenue, general fund revenue base, increasing your revenue base, these are some easy items that appear, and again, I'm not proposing any of them right now, but I think as we progress with budgets, these are items that are likely to come up during annual budget process, and it's just a result of the, the legislation that we're facing, but I would also tell you, it's a good, it's a good uh, business practice to be talking about this regardless as well. So that was a very quick overview. Is there any questions on the new property tax legislation? Uh, you mentioned that the consolidation of, the, of those various ones getting back to the 810. Is the debt service levy on top of that yet or included in that? No, the debt service, what's outside of the 810 as it applies to Pella, would be items. We have what's called special, you have your liability insurance is one of them, so that'd be your property and liability insurance is outside. You also, what's also outside is retirement contributions for city employees is outside. And then the last item that you have uh, that's called a special revenue fund levy is your health insurance premiums are also outside for city employees. And also as debt service is outside. Now one of the items that we have, uh, maybe I'm not sure if we put this up, if we have another slide or not, but what I would tell you because the debt service is outside of that 810, what's going to happen across the state of Iowa is if you look at property tax rate reductions on this, Cities are going to have less funds available for capital projects that they fund out of their general fund budget. So my feeling is you're going to see more projects being debt financed uh, on this as well. So point of reference, for years we've been somewhere between five to seven hundred thousand dollars of our eight ten limits went to capital projects to fund projects in community services, library, police, fire on that. In the future, I'm not talking, I'd say just generally. Some of those projects may end up being debt service projects in the future simply because the debt service levy rates outside the, the restrictions. And there's no there's no cap on that, right? Right. I, I think on July 1st, there was uh, the first bill to come down the funnel and has been signed by Governor Reynolds is 718. And it directly um, addresses the debt finance. That might be something that we want to bring ourselves up on. I've read it multiple times, called for a definition, and because it is so new, um, I think that before we would look at a lot of debt services, we need to familiarize ourselves. It also addresses eminent domain and a lot of other um, topics. I can so tell you what we know about the bill. That would be great. It. Um, what they did with the debt service levy is with our population base, the rule of thumb was for governmental projects without requiring a vote, you could issue up to generally $700,000 for non-essential right. corporate purpose bonds. And so these would be items like building renovations most of, most of the time, and when we're talking about non-essential projects such as streets. They increased that levy amount up to a million dollars on, on that. So it went from 700,000 up to a million dollars. So that was something that was appreciated with the legislation. But as far as I'm aware, I'm not sure that there's been any talk about limiting or having more items subject to referendums at this point in time. That's something that could be potentially in future legislative years that I agree we're gonna to have to closely monitor. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> All right, anything else? Looks like in a nutshell, in the near future, if you have water in your basement, you better contact your state representative. <laughs> Okay, let's move on to a discussion about uh, an update on the ambulance. I guess, Mr. Mayor, and as Mayor DeWard stated, we have an update on the Pella Ambulance. I'm going to preface my comments. The purpose of tonight's discussion is really intended to address a long term strategy from a Pella perspective as well as a short term strategy on this for the Pella Ambulance. As Council is well aware, the Pella Ambulance, when we inherited the ambulance or began operating the ambulance on July 1st, 2022, the ambulance actually served areas outside of Pella. In fact, the map that we have over there, it served the four budding townships that abut Pella. That would be the Lake Prairie Township in Marion County, as well as the Summit Township, and I believe the Richland Township, as well as the Black Oak Township in Mahassa County, along with the city of Lighton. 
Now, as far as our strategy that we're talking about tonight, um, what we would state from city staff's perspective is that we believe that the ambulance provides an essential service not only to our community, but also to the rural entities that above Pelham. The goal is to continue to be able to continue to provide the service, and that's what we're here to talk about tonight is the strategy. We view also that it's imperative that all parties work together to continue to provide ambulance <coughs> services to our constituents in the future. Now, with that being said, I think there's a unanimous agreement that it's, it's an essential service, it's needed, it's demanded by the public, at least from the city of Polo, that's what I've heard from our, our, our residents on this as well. I would also tell you that working together for all parties is likely to mean financial concessions by all parties as well, so we need to keep that in mind. Now to put this in a proper perspective, for fiscal year, this current year, we have a deficit both from an operational and a capital improvement perspective that we're looking at a subsidy of just over $740,000 for this next year on it. So when we talk about the ambulance and long-term strategies, we need to keep in mind that we're also facing property tax legislation starting next year. And when we talk about long-term strategies, those long-term strategies quickly get mingled in when you're talking about operating subsidies with short-term dealings as well. So. Please keep that in mind as we proceed in, in some of the items that we're going to discuss tonight. So let's go ahead, please, Mandy. Mm -hmm. First item that we have is the essential services tax. If you recall, during our last policy and planning meeting, we talked about this, and in a nutshell, the Board of Supervisors has the ability to, to authorize a referendum in Marion County and also in Mahaska County for a new tax to fund ambulances uh, be for the referendum. It'd be a voted upon referendum both for the rural portions of the county as well as the city of Pella if they authorize it. Now for them to do this, what they have to do is declare the essential ambulance services an essential service. They also have to authorize what the new levy rate would be. It could be up to 75 cents per thousand on this as well. And we've heard a lot of good talk about this and today an advisor group has been formed and they've done a lot of, put a lot of good information together. There's been a lot of good discussions on it as well. One of the items that we have, and they haven't got, they've just been formed, but we haven't yet targeted a date for a referendum. Now, from city staff's standpoint, we view and keep in mind, um, when we talk about our ambulance services, we actually fund a considerable portion of both Marion County and Mahaska County. So when we look at future years and state legislation on operating levies, uh, reductions in that, and limiting property tax increases on it, we believe that it could be challenging to provide ambulance services to rural areas without recovering our cost in the future. So we think it's important to identify a long-term plan along with short-term action steps as well. Now, in looking at this, we have two representatives, I believe Council Member Banstra is, is one of our representatives along with Chief Higginbotham on the other. And this is simply from the Pella perspective and we wanna make sure before we state this that we have a discussion on it and so far to date we've done some research on this. We believe just on reviewing the timelines with the city attorney and the county auditor that the county could be in a position to call for a special election on March 5th, 2024. Now to do that, that would take by and large adopting the practices and the operational methods as they currently exist within the county. And we've had some discussions, the chief and I, on, and the theory would be is if you adopted an operational model where wherever the ambulance is providing services, the tax revenues from those districts would go to the entity providing the service. So it by and large would resemble what's currently being provided to date. In our case, we provide ambulance services to the city of Pella. If the referendum passes, property taxes generated in Pella would flow to Pella. At least that would be our thoughts on it. Similarly, if we're providing ambulance services to Lake Curry or Summit in the future, property tax revenues generated in those townships would, would flow to Pella because we're the ambulance provider. <coughs> Looking at it, we believe the group has a very challenging um, task at hand, but we also think too that when you look at the realities of providing ambulance services, the financial challenges on it, it's good to set a date out there. And based on our preliminary research, if we were able to set that date and meet all the timelines in order for that to happen and have the referendum, the referendum would have to be approved by 60% of the voters on a countywide basis. 
And so what would happen is if we could have the referendum on March 5th, you could have referendums twice a year, once in March and generally once in November, that would allow starting next fiscal year, so that would be once again the same fiscal year where the new property tax legislation goes into effect, we could actually start collecting the new tax to help fund the ambulance service. So again, these are just assumptions. There's no guarantee that the supervisors will declare an essential service. First of all, they have to get a recommendation from the advisory group that it's for an essential service. Second of all, they have to approve the levy amount, but say it was 75 cents. We believe that generate $470,000 from the city of Pella for the Lake Prairie Township, about 142000 and we may be off the summit because we know a portion of their district, they receive ambulance services, I believe, from the city of Monroe on it. So we're estimating 66000 but don't hold us to any of these, but if you add them all up, it's about $670,000. If you recall, our subsidy that we have in operating for those three entities is about $700,000. This year, in the future, it's going to be more because we're replacing ambulances in the future. So again, the thought would be is for our representatives to bring this up to discussion for the advisory group to dive deeper into it on the necessary timelines that would happen if you have a discussion with the advisory group and try to set a timeline for this along with keeping in mind that we're currently providing the services for the areas. And once again, if you recall when we said all working together we realize things are going to take patience, but we also have to identify and be able to recover costs to provide the service. And we think that's going to require sacrifice from everybody involved. So our thoughts, at least from an administration standpoint, we're able to get this out to the voters and have a referendum on it. The voters are going to weigh in on what their thoughts are on funding ambulance services in the future. And that can help offset our subsidy that we're currently incurring to provide services to the city of Pella along with rural Marion County as well. So, any questions before I go on? There's one, I think, correction on your second to the last big bullet point. Fiscal year starting July 1, 24, instead of 23? Yeah, uh, well, it would be, 20, it'd be 25. So it would be, it'd be July 1, 2024. Yeah, so yeah, you, yeah, you, you yeah, 23 yeah. on there, right? Yeah, I stand corrected. That's an error on our part. So it would be July 1, 2024. So again, the thought would be that would help align with the new property tax legislation and, and help us also fund the ambulance service, which is once again, we believe an essential service for our constituents. Okay, let's go ahead, uh, Mandy. Now a little bit of the dynamics, when you look at that group, if, if you remember, we inherited an area, and I'm gonna state for the record, We've had a successful partnership, and from our, our side of things, when we talk about the fire department, we've had a, a partnership with this group that's been largely, we've been in contact with representatives for Lake Prairie for a long time. I've been here 22 years. For 22 years, they've been good to work with. We've had a very successful partnership. But when you deal with ambulance services and the tax, you talked about essential services tax, you gotta recall, Remember, Marion County's put together an advisory group. They're considering an essential services tax. At this point in time, we're not sure what Mahaska County is doing. We have a meeting um, this upcoming week with the EMA, Commission, EMA representatives from Mahaska County. We're going to find out where they're at with the essential services tax. And our thoughts are, as a little bit later on, as far as a recommendation, what we have on it, we're going to circle some dates that we're going to report back to council on the item. But that time will also disclose Mahaska County's plans for an essential services tax. And the reason I'm, I'm talking about this, if you recall, on here, why it's important to be talking about what the two counties plan to do is let's look at the scenario. Let's say eventually, let's say Marion County approves an essential services tax, but Mahaska County doesn't. We would still have the dilemma from funding the ambulance is that. Marion County would be paying property taxes, but our coverage area extends over to Mahaska County. So the issues that we've talked about, both on a short-term issue, would still persist in Mahaska County if they're not going to if they're not going to pursue the essential services tax. So we just wanted to bring that to council's attention that the ambulance funding looks like it's going to be on a county by county basis in the future, and it depends if the, if the respective county adopts an essential services tax or not. Okay. Let's go ahead, please, Mandy. Okay, brief update on the rural townships we talked about last time. 
just trying to get everybody up to speed. In May, uh, council considered an offer from the entities that, again, those are the four townships plus the city of Lightning to provide ambulance service. And what they had proposed was last fiscal year that ended on June 30th, 2023. The current fiscal year um, that ends on June 30th, 2024, one fiscal year past that, so that'd be 2025. They had proposed $36,000 per year. In May, when we looked at the, the review, the subsidy, in other words, what was the net loss on serving this area, it's about $130,000. Council authorized staff to propose the following uh, to these entities is what we did for last year, we agreed on their amount of $36,000 in providing the service. <coughs> for 23, um, at that time, we actually only had 23, 24. But the thought was is if there's a net loss and net subsidy of $130,000, and this is all conditional as long as, as long as we're working towards an essential services tax, we'd split it. So city of Pella would have about 66,000, the rural entities would have $66,000. So we'd be in a partnership on a go forward basis. Now along with this, and keep in mind um, from our group, this has been led by Councilmember Bannister, not to put them on the spot and be thinking about them. We began negotiations with all these entities in October of last year. And so what we had mentioned and requested is there's agreement on the 2023 funding of the ambulance of 36,000. This is the council's proposal. Um, there's been some negotiations since then, but right now it's our understanding that the rural entities are gonna be meeting in early to mid-August. They're gonna hold a public meeting ambulance services and they told us it's our understanding they're going to be reviewing the city's proposal at that meeting. We had asked why the negotiations are going on about payment of ambulance services for last year and the representatives that we have it's our understanding that they they wanted to have an agreement with the city first before they paid for last year on it <clears throat> and so this is one of the items that we have from an action step standpoint so Mandy let's go ahead Now, we have a four-part plan as far as the long-term and the short-term. We recommend in step number one, as far as the action step, that our two representatives, which would be Councilmember Banstra and Chief Higginbotham, that they bring up at their next meeting at the advisory group the issue from Pella's perspective and the desired timeline to set a special election for March 5th, 2024 to the advisory group. And I'll state for the record, there may be issues out there that we don't know about that maybe it's not realistic to have this but you got to start somewhere on it and we'd like to know the answer we think it's imperative that the essential services tax looks like it's the long-term funding source for the ambulance and we also think that it's very important as this group studies options and reviews options that they keep in mind that absent a funding source it's difficult to provide ambulance service to entities outside there so we think it's very, very important that the group sets a date or a timeline what the ultimate goal is. And we've identified based off our analysis that March 5th, 2024. But we'd like to have our representatives discuss this with the, the advisory group and explore that date more, at least from the city of Pella's position, bring that up to the existing advisory group. So before I go on, is there any questions about recommendation number one? I would just ask, have, have you talked to the county auditor about yes. things and, and yes. does that fit the timelines? Yeah, we, we followed up with the county, we okay. followed up with both the city attorney and the county auditor on this and coming up with the state. Okay, uh, let's go to item number two, please, Mandy. And I believe we got this, maybe it's an item number three. Let's see, I'm probably gonna jump around on her. Yeah, there we go, let's talk about, because they're both on the same at the same time. So we'll go to Mahaska County first. We're gonna follow up with their EMA commission and find out if they're pursuing an essential services tax or not on it, and we're gonna report back to council on it. So hopefully the council's okay with us contacting Mahaska County and finding out their plans for the essential service. Okay, item number two, let's go back to the townships. Um, what we would propose by negotiations persist, we believe that these entities should pay for ambulance services for last year. The services have been provided. 
We incurred the expense to do this, and from our perspective, we've agreed upon a rate of $36,000, and we'd like to send them an invoice for, for the services. But before we did it, we wanted to make sure council was aware of it, and we wanted to, to answer any questions before we did it. And if council had concerns, we wanted to make sure we addressed it. <coughs> So the $410,000 that we absorbed um, from the um, ambulance services prior that they had in their funds, was yeah, that $410,000, was any of that the township's funding? The $410,000, we'd have to go back to the cash contribution, but it's my understanding of looking at this, it wasn't quite $400,000 what was left after zeroing out the nonprofit. What was left, it's my understanding, was enough to pay for an ambulance replacement that we had. And I believe that, that to answer your question, this is my understanding, but I'm a reliant chief on this one. Um, the rural townships, they used to pay a contribution for ambulance service, and it's my understanding the last payment was on July of 2021. That's that correct. The amount of $24,000 per year. They, they were paying $1,000 a month uh, up until, I believe it was July of 2019, and they upped it to 2000 a month. And then in July of 2021, when we entered negotiations with the city, they quit paying the 2000 a month. So technically, they owe 48000 to the city of Bella for the services provided. And that, what that covered is if you did $651, which it cost us to run out the door, for all our fire standbys, it was pretty close to $24,000 a year is what it cost us for fire standbys. Mm -hmm. That didn't even include our response for EMS. Any other questions? Or Sounds like any, a plan. any uh, reaction to this? Okay. All right, Mayor, let's cover the action plan where we're going to be at. So what our plan is, is on August 15th, that's going to be the next policy planning discussion. And and preface this, if the townships have their meeting before August 15th, we'll have the policy and planning discussion. If something happens and they can't get it scheduled, we may have to delay it to the first part of September. But we think it's important after they have their meeting and make a decision on the city's offer or take action on the city's offer, we'll have our session after, immediately afterwards. But tentatively, we're planning on August 15th. But we'll report back at that time, both with the Mahaska County and then the thought is, with August 15th, hopefully there's another advisory committee meeting that we can dive into this timeline for the essential services tax and further detail as well. Yeah, I think there's one scheduled for the poor part of August or the late part of July, I can't remember. Okay. Do you know where that'll be held, those meetings? The Marion County Public Health. Okay. number of meetings ago, a rural resident that was in attendance said, when I dial 911, I expect an ambulance to show up. And that's the bottom line. If you have an emergency, you expect an ambulance to show up. And this, this is not worth playing games with. a motion to adjourn. So moved. Manster four. All in favor, please say yes. Opposed, no. Mandy, please call the roll. Ian Struck? Aye. Four? Yes. Ian? Yes. Rainer Horst? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Motion passed. We are adjourned.